thank you all. Um, I'm saying it in my name and in the name of Lucas, because uh, we are glad to see you all in this uh, auditory. Uh, so this section today will be about the work of Lucas Chagas Lima do Carmo, and Lucas will present his work. And after we have this uh, a protocol in three parts. The first part, Lucas will give us like a oral presentation. In the second part, we have argumentation. In the third part, we have the jury that will attribute some kind of scores. At this point, we have approved it or not for the work of Lucas. We want to say thank you also to the jury members, Professor Saad Khan, Professor Fabio Murakami, and Professor Agnes Scheer. Uh, Lucas, you have now uh, something about 50 minutes to present our, your results. After that, we have like uh, 10 minutes for uh, has a, a break. And after we continue with the second stop, step, name it argumentation. Thank you very much. Oi. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so my name is Lucas Chagas Lima do Carmo. I will be presenting presentation today. And okay, I'll be presenting my dissertation today. One, 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 okay. Sorry about that, microphone wasn't working. Um, so my name is Lucas Chagazima do Carmo. I'm gonna be presenting my dissertation today and then um, defending it. My dissertation is named <coughs> Cosmetic, uh, Cosmetic Emotions Physical Stabilities uh, Screening by Means of Rheology. And this was a work that was a combination of efforts from multiple parties such as Grupo Boticario, uh, the chemistry department, and the CAPES that has funded the research, and it does fund most of the research in Brazil, and of course, the Federal University of Paraná. <coughs> I am a student from the pharmaceutical science program, and this presentation will be divided in these sections. First, the introduction, where I'll present the subject, and then uh, a little bit of a review of the concepts and methodologies, <coughs> the objectives, materials and methods where I'll explain all the how the experiments were performed and how they were analyzed. The results and discussion will be divided in four parts. Uh, first, the classic methods of stability assessment for cosmetics. Second, the influence of oil content on rheology. Third, the influence of time, storage time on rheology. And then finally, the rheological thermal analysis, which was the, the main experiment that was used to, do, to perform the screening. And then finally, the final considerations and my personal conclusions about the project. <coughs> oh. 
Okay, so firstly, uh, we have to understand that the cosmetics industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, not only in Brazil, but also in most of the countries throughout the world. Uh, it has been growing almost constantly and linearly over the past 10, uh, 10 years. And it is, this growth is a result of uh, the, the consumer's interest that is growing on these products but also their, um, their expectations are also growing. So the industry has come up with new, is, is having new challenges in producing different formulations and producing different products to meet those needs from the consumers. Now, with all that demand from the population, uh, some challenges arise. And the first one, and, and I think that the most important one, is that the these, these products, they need to be evaluated on their physical stability, their quality, their biological safety. And here we're gonna, I'm going to try to explain how to improve the phys physical stability assessment of these products so companies start to reduce the time that it takes to uh, predict the stability of these products. Now, the main method that is used today in Brazil at least, is what? is this guide that was formulated by the uh, National Health Surveillance Agency here in Brazil. And this guide is, has some methodologies that are not necessarily new methodologies, not very complex methodologies, that in most cases don't, don't have the capacity to assess prematurely the stability of the products. They are only assess the, the properties of these products over the time that they're being analyzed. So in this uh, guide, there's not a lot of predictive tests, and it, um, it, most of the methodology takes uh, up to 90 days of evaluation to determine if a formulation is stable or not. And this time is not uh, efficient for the industry, it is not very economically viable, so our main goal here is to try to reduce that time uh, under a period of a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of days. These products, uh, th they use these uh, methods to evaluate the stability of creams and lotions and gels and shampoos. And the one thing that creams and lotions have in common is that they are emulsions. And emulsions, are a system, of, a colloidal system of two liquid emissible phases. They, they can either be of a oil in water phase represented on the left, or water in oil represented on the right. And they usually have uh, the droplets that are dispersed, usually have a size of one micrometer to 100 micrometers. <coughs> and these are the structures, these are the, this is the system that, is com that composes uh, creams and lotions that are used both for cosmetics and pharmaceutical products. Now these emulsions, they can be stabilized by different types of stabilizers, different types of molecules or particles that can be used to stabilize them. So here on A, we have droplets of oil inside a continuous water aqueous phase that are stabilized by some type of ionic mechanism, and then in B we have droplets that are stabilized by uh, solid particles, and on C we have droplets that are stabilized by polymers, and then on D we have droplets that are stabilized by a molecular surfactant, which is a type of molecule that, ha that have properties uh, that can interact between aqueous and oily phases and then reduce the interfacial tension of the interaction between them. And then on E we have multiple emotions where you have aqueous phase dispersed in the oily phase and then dispersed on the aqueous phase, and in F the same, but with multiple droplets. Now, emulsions are thermodynamically unstable systems. They are inherently unstable systems, because to form them, you need to add some energy to the system so you can generate these droplets. So on this graph here, we have on the x-axis, time, and then the y-axis, the energy. And this is just a relative energy. But when you're producing emulsions, you're adding energy to the system. 
And to explain the thermodynamics of emotions, we have to make two assumptions. First, that is that the enthalpic term here present, represented by delta H is proportional to, is directly proportional to the surface area term. And then the second assumption that we have to make is that the entropy term times the temperature is much, much smaller than the um, surface area term, which allows us to claim that it's, uh, neg um, sorry, that is not very determined, determined doesn't determine the, the relationship of energy in this equation. So it's negligible in this case. So the result is this equation, uh, free energy uh, equals to the interfacial, ten uh, interfacial area between the two phases. So in this case, when you're adding energy to the system, we have we form droplets, and the Gibbs free energy increases, the surface area increases, and the entropy increases as well, but it's, not, it's neg neg negligible in this case. So as time goes by, we see that the tendency of the system is to decrease the free, en free energy. And this happens by coalescence and aggregation and flocculation. And finally, the result is that we have the two different, the two different sa phases separated all over again. But if that is true, if all emulsions are thermodynamically unstable, then how do we have creams and lotions that are stable over time and they take uh, weeks and maybe months to destabilize? Well, we can add a barrier a kinetic barrier between the droplets that prevents them from coalescing and flocculating and aggregating. This barrier is mediated by those uh, ionic systems that are cause, cause the repulsion between the droplets or polymer systems that provide a steric hindrance between droplets or even in the case of the emulsion studied, thick layers of surfactants that are surrounding the droplets and prevents them from coming too close together and destabilizing. Another strategy is to add a polymer that is cross-linked to prevent droplets from migrating and prevent them from colliding with themselves. And this equation here is the general relationship that we have for emotions when very diluted. This is the fraction of dispersed phase in the total phase. So for emotions that are very diluted with a phi less than 0.02, we have this relationship where the dispersion viscosity, the continuous phase viscosity, is, uh, is inversely proportional to the sediment, the creaming velocity. And then we have the radius of the droplets that also has an influence on the velocity of creaming or sedimenting, depending on the, the density. And the dis density difference between the drop, the aqueous and continuous, the internal and external phase, is also relevant for diluted emotions. But the same principles apply for emulsions that have higher concentration, but other factors come into play as well when you have more droplets dispersed. So here's a summary of all the breakdown mechanisms of emulsions. Depending on the, the nature of the dispersed phase, it can either cre cremate or, or go up, migrate towards the surface, or sediment. And there is a phenomenon of also ripening, which is the increase of droplets. <clears throat> there is a phenomenon of flocculation, which is the aggregation of these droplets. And then the final result is the complete separation of phases here, uh, shown by this top part of the figure. And, however, on the creams that were formulated in this project, we not only have dispersed droplets, we have structures that are formed because these, two, these components are part of it. The cetocereal alcohol has the capacity of forming uh, bilayers, uh, surfactant bilayers that looks a little bit like this. So on here, on the, the figure on the right, we have these structures here. There are bilayers of surfactant that can branch out and can uh, aggregate and form multiple layers of surfactant um, on a crystalline liquid phase represented by C here, or maybe surrounding droplets represented by those structures surrounding the droplets in E. And the properties of these uh, creams can be described by both viscosimetry and rheometry. Now, for viscosimetry, we are only measuring 
the flow properties of these materials, and we're not measuring the elastic and viscous moduli of these materials. And what is the difference? Well, the, the difference is that this flow properties don't correlate well to the structure in its resting state. So by using rheometry methods, we can uh, measure elastic and viscous properties that are more correlatable to the properties of the material when it's resting, when it's not flowing. And it's usually non-destructive method because it doesn't shear the sample as to so, so hard as to destroy the, uh, the internal structure. And is usually used uh, in small stresses and shear rates. So in rheometry, you have the concept of elastic, elasticity, and viscosity. And to exemplify, here on the top illustration, we have um, a material that is completely elastic. It's purely, el purely elastic. And we can see that the stress, the shear stress on the black line is completely in phase with the deformation of the sample, which is on the orange line. So this is purely elastic because there is no lag between the tension applied and the response of the material. Now here for purely viscous materials, we have a 90 degree phase angle between the tension that is being applied, the shear stress is being applied, and the deformation that the sample is exhibiting. And for all viscoelastic materials, which are the most, most materials are, are viscoelastic, we have a difference, uh, th this uh, shift in the angle is bigger than zero and smaller than 90. So for materials that have a delta between zero and 45, they're more elastic. And for materials that have more viscous properties, they are between 45 degrees and 90 degrees. And here are, are the experiments that we are using to characterize these motions. The first one is the amplitude sweeps, where we increase the tension as a function of time. And by that, we can measure some variables, like the cohesive energy of the structure, which is the measurement of the energy of the dispersed structure, the huge stress, which, which is the stress where the dispersed structure starts to break down, and the linear viscoelastic region, which is a range of stresses where the, where the sample did not deform irreversibly. So this is the yield stress represented by this dotted line. And everything under that stress is the linear viscoelastic region. We also have frequency sweeps, where we measure the relationship to time of these structures. So the relaxation time, that is the inverse of the crossover point determined here, is the time that it takes for the structure to relax in a determined stress condition. So it's a constant stress being applied over different frequencies. The complex viscosity is the viscosity material, but it also takes into consideration the elastic modulus. And we have something uh, called the gel, struct param gel struct structure parameters that are the values that represent the extension and the strength of, of the gel network of emotions. Now, the, the most important experiment that was uh, designed for the project was a rheological thermal analysis, where we set a constant, like Brummer, we set a constant shear rate, uh, shear frequency, and shear tension, and vary the temperature over cycle. So in 2000, Brummer uh, found that if you have temperature cycles being applied over the samples, if G prime and G double prime, that is the elastic and viscous modulus, moduli, are constant over time, constant in temperature range, and constant with changing stresses, and that stress can be either temperature or humidity or storage time, then you have a, a, a stable formulation. So here on the top left, he described this formula as being a stable formula. So here we have G prime on the y-axis and G and, and temperature on the x-axis. So over several temperature cycles, he found that G prime for these samples were constant, which was not true for other samples that have very uh, varying uh, values of G prime over the, the temperature cycles. And then a little bit later, Tadros claimed that studying the rheological properties over as a function of temperature cycles or temperature is essential for the full evaluation of uh, cosmetics and emulsion stability. Later, Brummer published in his book in 2006 a larger scale example, um, a larger scale study where he showed that for distinct, distinct storage times, 
these emulsions here on the top had more a higher variance, and then this, these ones were more stable over the temperature. And he claimed that this was one way of assessing emulsion stability. And then this method started to be used for, uh, by my, more researchers, like Lata and Laka and collaborators, and then later it started to show up on handbooks, and people started, started to notice the, the methodology. And then the most recent uh, studies found also came to the, to the same conclusions that low thermal stability as function of G prime and G double prime changes. Um, they discovered that this for food, food products, and the same here with a, oil, a water and oil emulsion that was uh, used as a cosmetic product. So the variables that we evaluated over time for, these, for the samples that were formulated are the G prime and G double prime curve prof profiles, the crossover frequency, use stress, complex viscosity, cohesive energy, weak gel model param parameters, and then the rheological thermal analysis parameters. And then we also measure the droplet size distribution over time and difference between samples, stability over centrifugation, droplet morphology, pH, conductivity, and sensory properties. These on, on purple here are the ones that are usually used in the cosmetic industry. So the objective was to develop a protocol of rheometry experiments to predict cosmetic emotions, physical stability. And then the specific objectives were to prepare oil and water cosmetic emulsions based on the Brazilian pharmacopoeia that are stable over the experiment duration, promote the structural instability of these products that were developed, conduct accelerated structural stability assays, long-term shelf life stability assays, and then finally correlate the rheological properties and parameters with the emotion stability. So the final proposal of the project was to go from here, the current model that is used, where we have 30 to 90 days of stability studies, to make a decision, uh, to make a decision whether or not they are stable, to reduce this time for, uh, to one screening day and reduce the time that it takes for this decision to be made in the prototyping uh, stages or the formulation stages and development stages. So we chose a non-ionic cream that is described on Brazilian pharmacopoeia. And to stress this cream, to, it, it is a very stable cream. It is known for decades to be very stable. And to destabilize, we increased the concentration of mineral oil <coughs> to see if that would destabilize these formulations over time. And we chose, uh, we, we produced several uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So the methods of producing these, these creams is described on the national formulary of the Brazilian pharmacopoeia. And both phases were oil and water and aqueous phase were heated to 80 degrees. And then the, the aqueous phase was poured over the oily phase at 5.5 uh, milliliters per second at 50 RPMs. And then the emulsion uh, refining was done using a Silverson high shear mixer for two minutes at 3,000 RPM. And then finally, for the cooling stage, it was immediately um, transferred to, it was immediately agitated at 50 RPM at, with a helix paddle for 30 to 50 minutes uh, until it reached roughly 25 degrees Celsius. After that, these formulations were um, covered with PVC paper and they were stored at an ambient temperature for maturation. So uh, seven formulas were produced. For A, B, C, and D, we produced three batches. And these numbers here are the oil fraction and the mass fraction of these formulations based on the mineral oil that was added to the formulation. So as we increased the oil concentration, we hoped to find more unstable formulas. And for each one of these batches, in each one of these formulas, we, we measured, um, volt. we did all these tests, the microscopy, uh, Fraunhofer diffraction to measure the size of the size distribution of the droplets, oscillatory rheometry to determine the rheological parameters, 
sensory tests, uh, including olfactory and visual tests, centrifugation to, uh, to have an accelerated study of phase separation and then pH and conductivity. All these tests were performed in 1, 7, 14, 28, up to 182 days at ambient temperature and for 14 days stored at a climatic chamber at 40 degrees Celsius. So for the first part, the classic methods will, discuss, will be discussed. So here on this table, we see that these formulations that are on this table with these batches were the ones that separated phases macroscopically and by centrifugation. So on the middle column here, we see that DC, uh, batch C of formula D, separated phases within 24 hours of production. And for all of these other samples, we saw phase separation at 28 days for the batch B of formula D, age A, 42 days, and I, A, 56 days by centrifugation, but not macroscopically. All of these formulas that were stored, sorry, all of these formulas that were stored at higher temperatures, at 40 degrees Celsius, we saw separation within 14 days of, of storage. So here is a summary of all the formulas that failed this test and the ones that passed. So A and B passed, C, two batches failed, and all the rest failed. And this is one of the first uh, methods that is used to assess stability. Here, on measuring pH values, we saw, we took the average between these points here on this gray re rectangle and the standard deviation. So the shaded, the areas shaded in yellow are the areas where points were between plus or minus one standard deviation and two standard deviations. And the red shaded area here on the top and on the bottom are the formulas that were over two standard deviations or under two standard deviations. And we saw that for formulas D and H, up, um, under 91 days, they had already shown a um, not interesting profile uh, on the pH values because it w they were varying too much. And for other formulas, at 182 days, we saw that other formulas had failed this test. But again, this is not a, a method to assess stability of the formulations, just to determine whether or not the pH is varying. The only reason we would have to uh, reprove uh, these formulas if, were if they reach a pH value of under 4, which is not compatible to the skin. So here is a summary of the formulas and batches that failed and the ones that didn't. But this does not indicate stability in any way. So for the microscopic, microscop, microscopy evaluation, here we have diluted samples at 1% uh, mass volume. And we can see that formulas with uh, lower oil content, like A, have a different morphology and different size distribution than for D. <clears throat> and this was expected because as we added more oil to, to the formula, we expected to have larger droplets, and which was what happened. So we can see the profile of A and D, and then B compared to F. Here we also see that droplets are very small, and there's not a lot of deformation in them. But for F, with a higher oil content, we see that they are very deformed. They have a, uh, this strange morphology, and the width of the size distribution is much larger. And then here for C and H, we can see that C already has some larger droplets, but the morpho morphology remains mostly intact. But for H, we see some deformed droplets here and here, and some aggregates here on the top that can indicate that these formulations have uh, some type of gel structure that makes them be, uh, that helps them stabilize. With a higher magnification, we started to see that there is a shadow surrounding the droplets. And this shadow, represented here by this letter A, led us to believe that the reason these formulations were highly stable was because they, have, they had a thick layer of surfactant over um, on the interface between aqueous and oily face. And we can see that there are also these structures that could be a result of a surfactant buildup and surfactant uh, crystallization. We also see the same profile for formulas for formula B, and we see the, the same thing happening for several of, of other formulas. So we investigated 
uh, using polarized light microscopy, where we found that these formulas actually had these formulas had these um, liquid crystal, crystalline liquid phases surrounding surrounding them, which was which is identifiable by these uh, B refringent B refringent uh, B refringent um, structures here exhibit uh, shown by the white color, white color. And this happened for several of the formulations. And actually, there is a large buildup of these liquid crystals on the interface. And this happens for most of the droplets that are analyzed, if not all of them. For the, the, the Fraunhofer diffraction sizing, we saw that the formulations have, with higher oil content, have a larger size distribution. So here on the orange line, we have distribution from formulation D and C and B and A, we can see that A has a smaller size distribution than for formula D. And we also saw that over storage time, so here on the yellow, uh, one day of storage, on orange, 14 days of storage, purple, 28, and this dark purple, 182 days, we see that there's not a lot of difference between uh, so the size distribution on different storage times. We also saw that there is some difference in the batches uh, when, we, when we take the volume weighted mean diameter of these formulations. We see that batches uh, have different sizes, that different mean sizes. So for batch C of the formula A, we have uh, somewhat smaller sizes than the other batches. For the batch C of formula C, we have larger sizes over the storage time. And for formula D, we see that the batch C has even larger sizes when compared to formulas batches A and B. And this is obviously noticeable because it had separated phases uh, under 24 hours of storage. So it was expected that we saw large aggregates on this, uh, on this formula. So for the second part, I would like to concentrate on the influence of oil content on, re on rheology. And the relationship that we mostly saw was that <coughs> formulations with higher oil content, with uh, higher concentration of droplets, they had a higher elastic modulus. And it is, uh, in some references, some authors say, say that this, is a, this can be interpreted as a higher stability. If we have formulations that have a storage modulus, the G prime over, above G double prime, we have a, a stable formulation because the droplets within are not uh, migrating to the, to the not, not pre-mating or not sedimenting. And we saw that this behavior, this uh, relationship with the oil content is almost um, exponential. So here on the x-axis, we have the mass fraction of the formulations. On the y-axis, we have the G prime values within the linear viscoelasticity, viscoelasticity range. And we see that as we increase the oil content of these formulations, we have higher elastic moduli, modulus. Uh, one of the measurements was the yield stress, and it was measured by both oscillatory and rotational methods. And the yield stress is also uh, one variable that is, it has been used to assess whether or not the formulations are stable. However, we saw that the error is very large for this calculation and is even larger for the rotational measurements. So here we, on the oscillatory method we have on the x-axis, we see that it is more precise. This is the distribution of the values, while for the rotational methods we saw a larger distribution, which we identified as being less precise than oscillatory methods. However, this, um, the error was so big that we couldn't take any useful information from the yield stress. The cohesive energy is a calculation that is, uh, is calculated using the yield stress and the deformation of the, mater of the material. And we also is, uh, thought that it would be a good parameter to visualize, the, to determine the stability of these formulations, but the error was very big and we saw no correlation to stability and no difference significant difference between formulations. 
So we also couldn't extract any information about stability that could be correlatable to the cohesive energy. Now for the frequency sweeps, we saw a, a similar relationship. It seemed that for formats with a higher oil content, uh, they had a stronger network, and this can be seen by these two graphs. On the left, we have formulas A, B, C, and D, and on the right, F, H, and I. And we see that as the oil fraction increases, we see uh, both moduli are increasing. They have larger values as well. And here, uh, the relationship between oil fraction and the, vi the complex viscosity of these formulas we see that they are more viscous as the concentration of droplets increases, but there was no correlation to physical stability of these formulations based on the complex viscosity as well. In the third part, uh, I'd like to explain the differences of the rheological parameters over time. And here we see on this graph, on the x-axis, the storage time, on the y-axis, the yield stress measured by oscillatory methods and in all batches and all formulas. So here we can see that the yield stress does not show any trend of changing over storage time. The solid line here represents the average between all the values and the dashed line represents the plus or minus one standard deviation. And we can see that there, all of the formulas don't show any trend of uh, oscillatory yield stress over the storage time, and the differences between them are not very significant. Not very significant. So over time, we, see, we saw no relationship to the yield stress, and also we could not conclude that the formulation, the, the creams, had different properties using only this parameter. Uh, we did, though, saw some difference using the frequency sweeps. So here on the left, we have the formula A. On the top left, formula A batch A. And the bottom left, uh, formula A batch B. And we saw that over time, they actually have an increase in both moduli. And this, is, um, this is, can be explained by um, either uh, the, the crystalline phase that is surrounding the droplets becoming even thicker, which would uh, create a more resistant structure, or maybe the dispersed crystallized phase is, uh, is also increasing in size, which will also result in a higher uh, resistance of the structure. <clears throat> so from one day to up to 28 days of storage, we saw that one day of storage usually is a lot smaller the G prime and G double prime values are a lot smaller than in 28 days. And we, we, some authors say that this is a maturing step of the formulation, that it can take up to 14 or 28 days. The crossover frequency, which is the, the cross between G prime and G double prime over, uh, on frequency sweeps, uh, also did not, cha not show any relationship uh, with storage time we can see that is very linear. There's not a, lot, not a visible trend here. And it does not allow us to conclude anything uh, as physical stability goes. Now here are the power law parameters that describe the frequency sweeps. The parameter A is a parameter that is relatable to the strength of the interaction between the droplets. And the parameter Z is a parameter that relates to the number of interaction between droplets and its surrounding neighbors. We can see that the same relationship that was found um, in the other experiments, we found that the strength of these, um, these interactions is higher when you increase the oil fraction, but the number of interactions does not change a lot. And over time, we see that there is an increase of the strength of, strength of these parameter of the interaction between droplets. That could be explained by dehydration or the other phenomena that I explained earlier about um, the thickening of the surfactant layers on the droplet, on the interface between droplets, between aqueous phase and oily, oily phase. 
So finally, for the rheological thermal analysis, which was the most important experiment in the project, we performed um, 10 temperature ramps, consecutive temperature ramps, at constant frequency and a constant shear stress. And we observed the profiles for these creams as a function of the temperature cycles. Now here on this graph, we have uh, two consecutive cooling ramps for different formulas. And we observed that for these three formulas, A, B, and C, the temperature dependency, the dependency is very small. For formulas D and H, we see that the temperature dependency is a little bit bigger. And here, these points uh, shown in black are the points where the elastic modulus and the viscous modulus are inverse. So we have elasticity under vis uh, viscosity. And this can indicate that the structure of the cream is completely destroyed, in this case, at temperatures above roughly 38 degrees Celsius. For formulas with even higher uh, oil content, we can observe that this temperature dependency is much larger when compared to the other formulations described. And we see that there's also a hysteresis effect um, on formula F and a little bit smaller in formula I. However, the dependency of these formulas over temperature is much higher, which could indicate that these formulations are less stable than the previous ones. And also, we see that at a lower temperature, roughly 35 degrees, 34 degrees, the moduli cross over, which can indicate that they're more sensitive to the temperature and they are less stable to temperature. Now, we can also see the data in not, a not as a function of temperature, but as a function of time. And here we have consecutive uh, decreasing and increasing temperature ramps, indicated by the gray line. And the G prime and G double prime values, represented by solid symbols and open sy symbols. And we see that over several temperature cycles, the formulation uh, changes its properties over the temperature cycles. And we see that for formula C, we also have some points that, ha that we can observe a crossover, which doesn't happen for formulas A and B. And we can see a trend, a decreasing trend for G prime values and G double prime values here on C that we do not see for formulas A and B. This is the general profile of the formulas they were performed for every storage time in every batch, but here I'm only trying to show the general profile of these curves. Now for D and H, we see that there is a higher dependency uh, over temperature cycles as well. So here on the first temperature uh, cooling ramp, the G prime value for D is roughly around um, three, and then it decreases as the temperature cycles go. And so we try to measure these, uh, this constant that, uh, to see if, if we could use the, the calculations to uh, correlate to physical stability of these streams. And then for F and I, we also see a similar relationship, but much more erratic and much more um, <coughs> dependent on temperature than the previous formulations. So what was done is that to find uh, to calculate some parameters that could translate and summarize these experiments so we wouldn't have to analyze each and single one of them individually, uh, I sep we separated these points in eight groups. So we have G prime maximum values in cooling ramps, G prime maximum values in heating ramps, G prime in uh, cooling minimal points, and heating minimal points. So we had eight groups of points for each one of these experiments. Now, to calculate some parameter that would allow us to translate these numbers into physical stability, a linear regression model was applied over each one of these groups. So here in orange, this line represents the points that are within the G prime values on cooling ramps and the minimal values. So 
For each WAMP, they have a minimum and a maximum value. So these are the minimum values here. And we calculated the angular coefficient of this uh, regression model, and we called it alpha. And this alpha is an index of how much the formulation changes, the, these rheological parameters changes over temperature cycles. And this was calculated for each one of these eight groups for all the experiments over 182 days. Now, another parameter that was described in some other references is to calculate the ratio between these points that I had already explained and the value of the first ramp. So in the first ramp, you should have a very um, um, a reference of how your formula behaves, how your sample behaves. And then on the subse subsequent steps, you calculate how much they change as uh, as uh, how much they changed relating to the first step. So this C value here is the ratio between, in this example, G prime max, which are indicated by the arrows and the points in blue, and the first G prime value, which is this one. So by having these two parameters, alpha and C, we try to summarize the, these uh, these values on uh, density distribution here. So on the left, we have formulas A, B, and C on the storage time of one day, or after 24 hours of production. And here on the, on the bottom, after 56 days of production, we see that the C values, which are that ratio, uh, they're much more narrow. The distribution of these values are much more narrow, which indicates to us that these formulas do not change a lot over temperature cycles. All of those ratios, they are very close to one. So they, this can, indicates to us that the distribution is narrow and these values are not, um, they're not very small or very large. And we can see that same profile for both one day of storage time and 56 days of storage time. The same is not true for formulas with a higher oil content D and H are here in the middle. We see a wider distribution overall with some outliers, um, which indicates that these formulations are suffering more changes as temperature cycles go on. And here for F and H on the, the rightmost panel, we see also that the distribution is much larger and we have more, out, more outliers. Now here on this graph, we are showing the relationship of the alpha values, the angular coefficient values, over uh, time and over the, the mass fraction of these formulations. So here on the top left, by, in subfigure A, we see that formulations A, B, and C are, have very narrow distributions, and they are very close to zero. And here for formulation D, we have a wider distribution that is a little bit under zero, not a lot, but it is, it is an indicator of how much the structure changed over the temperature cycles. And we see that after 182 days, the distribution, the amplitude of the distribution becomes a little bit more wide, especially for formula C when compared to the first day, which can indicate that these formulations, um, C in this case, can be destabilizing faster than the other ones, uh, at least when compared to A and B. Um, so for the final considerations, I like to, to say that the temperature swing test was uh, somewhat quicker to predict the physical instability uh, than classic accelerated tests. So here on the left, we see that the profile of these curves, uh, it's somewhat correlatable to the phase separation that was observed macroscopically and after centrifugation. And the difference between the methods is that is one takes one and a half hours and the other takes 14 days. So that should be a sign that maybe these tests can help us uh, assess the stability of the formulations prematurely. The other rheological parameters, such as the crossover frequency, the yield stress, cohesive energy, and the profiles of G prime and G double prime did not uh, present important relevant information in determining the cosmetic shelf life uh, stability. And they were all conducted for formulas that were stored at ambient temperature. So 
we see that um, rheology is able to is able to uh, characterize these formulations, but not to predict their stability over time. We also discussed that and, and concluded that the formulations were very stable due to the formation of the tick surfactant layers on the interface and likely a gel structure that uh, fixated the droplets in place and prevented them from creaming or coalescing or flocculating. They're actually all flocculated, but creaming or coalescing. Uh, we saw that the droplet size had no influence on cream stability, cream stability over time. And as a final conclusion, we, we think that to start to implement the, these methods, we need a much larger number of samples and different materials and different formulations with different properties and different raw materials composing them. So I'd like to thank everyone from the laboratory. Um, Dr. Hilton Alves Freita, who has, uh, Freitas, who has challenged me a lot. But because of those challenges, I, I grew a lot and I learned a lot. I would also like to thank Isabella Maria Ferreira de Campos for helping me a lot in the initial stages of the of the project and for helping me um, analyzing results and discussing results and actually performing some experiments in some cases. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Silvia Guterres and Dr. Canina Paesi from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul who provided me with the raw materials and provided with some, provided some knowledge, uh, formulation knowledge. All my colleagues from Biopol, they have been helpful and very friendly. Um, Dr. Fabio Murakami, who not only helped me uh, become a better teacher on the uh, internship, but also was a great teacher in the graduation. Uh, Dr. Agnes de Paula Schir, who helped me uh, by lending us the, Schir, the high shear mixer from the Silverstone high shear mixer. Dr. Saad Khan, who we cannot see right now, but he's watching us and for accepting the challenge of being on an examining, examining, examining board in Brazil. Augusto, whom without, uh, not, none of this would be possible, the transmission, the everything, the media, the slides, and my parents who are here and also helped me a lot financially and emotionally, and Flavia, which is my better half, that has always supported me and always reminds me of how, how much I can do and how good I can, I can do things and that never doubt, doubted me. So that's it. I thank you for your presence and that's the end. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Lucas, for your presentation. But uh, we received now uh, a new from, uh, from the department. We are not allowed to have public from this moment at any section at the Federal University of Paraná, so we cannot have public in this place. We just received, I uh, just uh, talked with the uh, coordinator of the, of the uh, pharmacy, pharmaceutical program, so we need to ask you now, if you don't mind, I'm sorry, we just received it now from, that we cannot have public in this section. So if you want to say something to Lucas, please say it now because I will just ask you to leave this, this room. And please, uh, we need to remove the cough break from, from that central part of where, where you put some food because we cannot, uh, we cannot make, uh, to have it there, okay. But in the second part, when you have the, the defense of the thesis, the argumentation, we just ask you to please to be has uh, discreet, no. discreet as as possible, just to not not call uh, call you uh, call a lot of attention to uh, to us because we are not allowed to do it. So you can, if you can eat something, <laughs> and please after we can just leave the um, this auditorium. Thank you very much. So we can have like ten minutes, and after we can continue with the defense.
mulțumesc. August. Bond? Uh, good evening again. Let's continue with the defense of the Lucas Chagas Lima do Carmo dissertation. And now in this part of the defense, we have the argumentation. Let's start at this point with Professor Khan from the North Carolina University. Professor Khan, thank you very much for your attention and to read the work of Lucas. So you have something about 30 minutes to do some kind of questions about the work of Lucas. And thank you again for your uh, participation. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Uh, it's, uh, we, we can hear you. Okay. You can hear me? Okay. So um, um, I have some general questions, Lucas. Uh, and if you can't hear me at any time, let me know. So one of the questions I had was when you're doing this temperature uh, ramps up and down, Mm -hmm. Isn't there a thermal lag, like, you know, you're increasing the temperature in a linear rate and then decreasing it down, so the sample is not, is a thermal lag to the sample. Have you thought about that? Yeah, we, we, uh, in, okay. I'm going to go to, I'm going to turn off my video so that it's, I can hear better, okay? Okay. We saw in some cases that there was some, some thermal lag, definitely. We chose not to perform the experiments in a thermal equilibrium because we wanted to, to have the experiments run as fast as possible. And still we, have, we had experiments that were one hour and 30 minutes long. But to, to have a, a really fast experiment, we chose not to wait for thermal uh, equilibrium. The lag that we saw was, was noticeable, especially in the steps of on the, we had some 30 seconds between, ramp, between ramps, so this lag would be minimum, but we still saw some, some effects of wall slipping in, in lower temperatures that would allow us, allowed us to, to see the, this lag but uh, we chose not to, to do anything about it. We just measured the G prime and G double prime maximum and min minimum values to assess the structural change over time. Okay, okay. So you mentioned, so you, you, mentioned you saw wall Did slip. Did you say that? Did you say you saw wall slip, slip in some cases? Yeah, we, we, I saw wall slip in, in some cases in, in lower temperatures. And okay, okay. And then and how did, and then did, how you, did, did you did you did you account did you, for did wall slip? I'm sorry. When you saw wall when you saw at, wall slip uh, at say room uh, at say room temperature uh, when you're measuring uh, yield when you're measuring stress, yield stress switching, 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 when you're measuring yield stress, when you're measuring yield stress did you or did you or G prime, or, as, a or G prime as a function of frequency uh, if you saw uh, wall if you saw did wall you slip did you account for it by having rough Plates, rough or serrated plates, or plates, or serrated or plates, like or something like that. Well, uh, there's a chapter in the dissertation that I uh, described the rheometry gap selection, and unfortunately, with limited resources for the RS1 rheometer that we have here at the university, we only had uh, geometry that was cone plate to uh, two degrees and 60 millimeters of diameter, and in temperature. Um, in ambient temperature, we did not see wall slip. We only saw in lower temperatures in the thermal cycling test at low temperatures, be, uh, below okay. 10 degrees. Okay. And uh, wall slip was not accounted for because we actually couldn't do anything about it here on the university laboratory because we had no uh, rough uh, uh, sandblasted geometries or cross-hatched uh, cross geometries. Okay, okay. So so I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about now your, about your, now your yield, stress yield stress data. So you so measured yield, you stress, measured at yield what stress at what five hertz? Five hertz? Is that what you said? Um, all the experiments were performed at frequency sweeps. Were performed at uh, sorry, stress sweeps, amplitude sweeps were performed at um, five uh, five hertz, and. Uh, Prior to the to the experiments, I had tested some some other formulas to choose which frequency was best, and I tested one hertz, five hertz, and then ten hertz, 
and I saw that the, these, the data is not on the dissertation, but I chose 5 hertz because it showed a better profile for the linear viscoelasticity region. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you, so said you, uh, tried you said you tried one, one hertz, hertz, five hertz. You tried lower, you try lower because, because, a lot of time because a lot of times the mean stress measurements, measurements are are more are accurate, more accurate if you go to lower frequency, 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 frequency point one, five point one hertz, like that. Like that. Um, no, we we all we always performed with with the same in the same condition for all samples because we wanted to define a method that would be used for all these formulas. So I thought it was best not to change the parameters of the real logical experiment so we would have a better um, uh, relationship between the variables. So if, if we changed the, the parameters, then we would have different values, di different values that would not be correlatable to other formulas because we had different experiments for each formula. So chose to always use the same parameters. Um, I, I, I guess the question is not exactly this one. So could you, you repeat the, the focus of the question so I can understand yeah, so, it better? Yeah, so uh, what I was saying, so is, that I was saying is that a lot of times when you do these stress feed experiments, stress -feed experiments to get the yield stress, the yield stress uh, having a lower, uh, having frequency, a lower you frequency you more, accurate, you more results. accurate results. And so if, and you, do so that, if maybe, you do that, maybe you, know, you have a graph, you know, you have a graph of correlation of, of uh, yield stress, uh, yield stress and, and dynamic and, and, dynamic and you may have had a you may have had a better correlation that way. I don't know. I'm asking okay, you. Okay, I, I understand now. Um, I, I know that the viscoelastic samples all have frequency dependency, so I did not um, I did not know that having uh, smaller frequencies would probably result in a better um, reproducibility of the method. Okay. No, that's okay. fine. No, that's fine. Um, um, one uh, one, one uh, other question of these stress, stress, okay? okay. Sorry. Uh, so uh, so when you have a stress, you have a stress data sweep like data do, like you do, uh, we have, uh, we, have, have plotted we have plotted G prime, G prime times strain as a function of strain, strain, function of strain. and when you do that, and you when you do that, you get a maximum, and that is and that uh, gives you uh, stress, 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 stress a little bit better. Um, this is an approach, um, this is an approach we, uh, we uh, picked, up uh, picked up from McCosco and Scriven. Uh, something to think about. You don't have to do it. You have all the data. So what you do is you would plot G prime times strain on the y-axis versus strain. And a lot of times, and a lot of times, nice maximum, a very nice maximum. So you don't have to, and so you don't have to extrapolate your use. You can try. So you can try for one of your data to see what matches having. what you're having. Um, again, this um, idea came again, from, idea came from and Picasso Picasso and and something, something, and something we liked a lot. We so liked a lot. Comment. So just a comment. Okay. Okay. I have one. Uh, I have right, one. Just a second. Sorry. I, I just I didn't quite understand the the commentary, so I'm I'm asking my supervisor to see if he can explain it to me. Can you just wait a second, please? What I'm saying is, what I'm is saying a, is, there is a maybe there is maybe a better, maybe way, of a better way of getting more accurate yield stress data, data from your dynamic from your experiments. dynamic experiments. So what you could so do, what you could do, is you plot on the y-axis c prime c prime times times strain. So you, from your stress so you, data, your stress data you, on the y-axis on the y-axis plot times strain and on the x strain and on the x-axis plot strain. And then you'll see a maximum and a maximum and the maximum corresponds to yield. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, just something for you. To just something about. for you to think about. Uh, I have one. Uh, I have uh, one. A uh, couple of more uh, questions. Uh, so, so when you do a your when you do a your frequency right? when you do G right? prime and you G do G prime and G double G prime frequencies, frequencies, frequencies uh, you do uh, not see you a, do not see a crossover. See a crossover. So that suggests so that suggests that the are not are not gels, right? Gels, right? So if it's not a gel, gel so if it's not a gel, then not a gel, how do you have a yield stress? You have a yield stress? Well, in some cases, I don't see a crossover, uh, especially for the, the first storage time, uh, 24 hours. So I guess that I would characterize these creams as a, as a gel, but in, in later storage times, um, we can see that there actually are a crossover, so we classify them as viscoelastic liquids and not gels. Um, the crossover points uh, for the, the first day of storage, the, the first 24 hours days of storage, were estimated uh, using the, 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 re the software from the rheometer. But I would classify them as gels in that, in that, that condition. Okay. 
I'm sorry, viscoelastic solids. I was corrected here by my supervisor. Okay, um, I'm done. Um, I'm done. Very nice um, job. Very nice um, job. Um, I like the idea. I like the how idea. You measure you the alpha, measure and the alpha, and figure out stability. Figure out stability. Is a clever, clever idea. idea. A clever idea. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It was. Thank you. Uh, the alpha was actually something that we discussed and decided to do because there's not not a single reference mentioning this alpha parameter, but that uh, C parameter was something that has had been described. Uh, by Monica Burdenson in a Anton Parr uh, report, and it was reproduced in Musger book handbook about rheology. So, I thought that using both parameters uh, would help us understand if uh, the rheological thermal analysis would supply us with some information about physical stability of the formulation. So, thank you for acknowledging that. No, that was really nice. No, that was really also, nice. Um, uh, also, one last um, comment. One last comment. I actually was expecting, I actually was expecting uh, uh, samples that samples uh, like that D uh, and the H like D and the H to be more stable. So that was uh, so that was a uh, surprise. Was it a surprise? Or wild fraction? Or wild fraction less be. stable? But less stable? But anyway, anyway. Well, I I can actually try to explain that. I'm not exactly sure why what happened, but they were more viscous. They were they had higher elasticity. But I think that they destabilized most likely because the uh, emulsion refining step in formulation and the, in the preparation was not effective in mixing the phases. And we only couldn't see a phase separation sooner because it is so viscous that it trapped the oil molecules inside the, the cream and they had no room to migrate to the top or, or um, form droplets within the, the cream. So I, I guess that that's the, the most likely explanation to why they were unstable. They only appeared stable, but um, they, they appeared macroscopically st stable, but they weren't because homogenization, homogenization was not uh, sufficient enough to emulsify all of the oil. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm thank you. I'm thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, do you have any other question? No, I'm good. Thank no, you. I'm good. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Ken, for your precious contribution. We are really waiting to hear some considerations from you. Uh, thank you very much and again for your patience. And I, I want to ask you sorry for the delay you have today to start this defense. Thank you again. And I want now, I want now to ask for Professor Shear to give us her um, considerations about the Lucas job. First of all, Professor Hilton and Lucas, I would like to thank you for the invitation. And uh, this area has a lot of challenges, and the emulsion or the cosmetic cream are dynamic, thermodynamically stable, and we must understand well uh, their behavior to face the necessities of the petroleum, food, and cosmetic areas. Uh, nice to meet you, Professor Kahn. Um, nice to see you again, Fabio. Now, I would like to discuss uh, a little more some points to understand what you did and perhaps some suggestions for next work. Some observations I wrote here and in your work, and you can read later, okay? Uh, let's focus on two main points uh, in the beginning. Uh, you, can, you must check it, the different information from abstract and to resume in Portuguese. There are some things yes, that are different. Uh, yeah, they're different. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. <laughs> I, will, I will definitely yes. check that. Okay. And, and final of uh, item two, I think it was missing a, a paragraph or an abstract about what will be done in your work. Uh, in the final of the team too. Yes, I, 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 I think that there is a, a missing of a paragraph to say, well, now, so, I will do these things, okay? Okay, so, okay. so that suggestion would be in the results or no, methodology? No, in the it, it in two, it's the la, let me see, page. Um, uh, before material methods, the, all this chapter two, yes, the literature review, uh -huh. okay? Okay. 
uh, before I start the material methods, you can okay. say just give a summary of valorize okay. your work here. Okay, that's uh, only a suggestion. Okay. Um, in page f uh, 55, I have one long 55. You describe a very interesting things here. Yes, in figure five, okay? Figure 15? Yeah, the, the last paragraph of uh, page fi 25, and the next one is the figure five, okay? You discuss this for a long time, it was presumed the cosmetic screen product will with humus fine works, okay? Uh huh, yeah. Okay. Uh, do you believe that you are working with these systems, then emotion? I'm sorry? Do you think or do you believe that you are working with this type of uh, instruction, then emotion? I think that with the uh, polarized light microscopy, we can definitely see that there is some. Uh, build up, build up of build up of surfactants on the mm -hmm. interface of the droplets, and um, I didn't show them exactly the other dispersed structures because I couldn't find them. Okay. But it is widely described that these um, uh, liquid crystals are present on these types of formulations. Mm -hmm. um, I had very little time to perform the polarized light microscopy because we don't have uh, easy access to it. But I thought that, I think that if we perform more investigations, uh, we could find those structures. And I, I believe that these surfactants, the cetocero alcohol, do form these types of structures. Mm -hmm. uh, cannot be completely certain now that if they produce these um, bilayers that have branches and, and whatnot, but I think that it is widely described, and I think that this happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And going out to material methods, uh, you explain uh, the table one. Uh, in your work, it's not so clear about table one. But now, your presentation, you explain very much. I'm in, perhaps, you can, can you see the table one? Page 44. 44. Yeah. <coughs> so all this, this formulation, uh, the only change is the proportion of uh, water and oil. Yes? Yes. The other one is, is the same. So um, do you think about the critical micellar concentration about this polar, polar wax? Uh, no. Um. I'm sorry, the, the critical concentration? Yeah, the critical micellar concentration. Because you state 10% of polar wax. Mm -hmm. Is this the, the surfactant? Yes. Yes, it, it's, it's a, a blend of polysorbate 60 okay. and cetocere alcohol. But I don't know exactly at what proportions they are mixed okay. because it's an a industry okay. mm -hmm. secret. But we, I didn't define the, the critical okay. micellar concentration. Mm -hmm. the, this formula was actually changed from the national form yeah. of the Brazilian pharmacopoeia. The original uh, formulation is 15% polyvax. Mm. And there is no mineral oil added to that okay. in the original formulation. It is used uh, for creams and lotions. And for lotions, the concentration is roughly 7.5%. Okay. So the mineral oil you added to, to the formulation, yes? Yes, I added because okay. we needed to find a way to destabilize these formulations okay. without uh, changing the concentration of the okay. polo X, because if we d uh, reduce the concentration of polo X, mm -hmm. the rheological properties would be completely different. They okay. would be much more liquid than they actually are. Okay, understand. Mm -hmm. And in page 45, where the conductivity and pH measures for dilute samples? Why you have to dilute them? You don't have a, a equipment to do the 
directing the, your samples. Well, the the pH, um, the pH could have the been done in directly on the sample. Um, but it depends on the electrode. Some do. Some have the sensor that is very. Uh, it's it, the inner sensors, and if we try to put the, the the sensor on the cream, it wouldn't fill up enough, so we can measure the pH. That was the case for the conductivity measurements. Mm -hmm. The the electro the electrode uh, had an inner sensor, and there was no way to put cream inside the electrode, so we could measure it. And diluting 10% is usually what is done for these formulations, both in the cosmetic industry and pharmaceutical okay. um, manipulation pharmacies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I worry about one thing. It's your difference in the batch samples. Mm -hmm. The batch samples sometimes are very different. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Because we need this. Uh, be so <laughs> the same, <laughs> but what do you think the, the um, uh, Well, is <laughs> there is on page 51, yeah. I wrote three paragraphs trying to describe okay. why that happened. Um, I think that the, the, the most significant difference between batches was the cooling rate in the cooling step of emulsification. Okay. And mm -hmm. At the beginning of the, the, the project, we thought, well, maybe we should try to, to improvise a reactor so we can have a, a fixed cooling rate mm -hmm. so we wouldn't have these differences between batches. Okay. Uh, at the, in the last paragraph of that session, I say that, well, the, the, the difference is not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Because, <laughs> okay, if I have... <coughs> my idea for the project is to have a positive control, a negative control, and then everything in between so I could try to find the, the rheological parameters and other parameters mm -hmm. to correlate to stability. Okay. So is it bad having <laughs> uh, different batches? It, is, it depends on your point of view. Mm -hmm. I think it was bad because I, I don't have enough robust data to make assumptions. Okay. But I think that we, despite having these different batches, we found some, some relationships okay. with rheology to physical yes. stability. Yes, you did. <laughs> you did. So, um, in the <coughs> page 15, you say that for these systems, uh, for the systems, let me see. <coughs> never occur as long as never, never. Do you agree with this never? Now, you, page 50. 15. Um, um, for these systems, uh, the last paragraph. Um, page yes. For these systems, it is possible that creaming or sedimentation never occur as long as the solid likes to. Okay. And uh, you repeat the never. Do you do you agree with this never? I am I am trying to look. Uh, page fifty, cinquenta. Yeah. Um, last the paragraph. The last paragraph. Yeah. Um, I think so. Never, okay, uh, okay. Yeah, never <laughs> occur as long as, okay. Uh, never occur as long as the solid like structure of the cream remains unchanged. I think that it is a bold statement to make. It's very bold to, to yeah. claim that never. <laughs> but I think that um, uh, maybe on, on the text is not clear, and maybe I just made a, a bad statement. Mm -hmm. But the idea was that uh, creaming or sedimentation okay. would never occur as long as the solid structure of the cream remains unchanged. Mm -hmm. And I took that idea from the concept that if you have polymers stabilizing the emulsion, then if, and, and if the, the polymers are in, are in a high concentration, then the droplets will never uh, come close to get, uh, enough together to coalesce. Now, there are other mechanisms of emulsion destabilization, like also ripening, which do not depend on the the physical distance between the droplets. So I think that this statement is actually wrong because uh, coalescing is not the only mechanism that causes yeah. uh, uh, emulsion phase separation. Okay. Thank you for, for noticing that. Uh, and 
and page 53, you say that the emulsion type was defined macroscopically by observing the immigration of water diluted droplets to the top of the dispersion. Mm -hmm. Could you explain this? Uh, this means that, um, just let me annotate this part. Uh, this means that the emulsion type, whether it is oil in water or water in oil, mm -hmm. was determined by diluting in water and observing where the droplets would migrate to. If they migrate uh, towards the surface, mm -hmm. then it is oil in water type. And if they migrated to the bottom, then it would be a water in oil type. Um, I'm sorry, uh, that's not yeah. exactly true, but mm -hmm. that was the... The, idea. the 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 okay. uh, reasoning behind the, mm -hmm. the evaluation. Well, page sixty three. Now you are studying a diameter. Sixty three. Let me see. Sixty two. Sixty three. Uh, when you are uh, expli explaining the, the the maximum diameter and you say that you without a solution of mineral oil so this recipe without mineral oil was a emotion um, <laughs> well then we, we go back to <laughs> defining um, there was a misconception that I had explained that creams are emulsions. Okay. They're not just emulsions, okay. right? They have other structures. There are colloidal systems that are much more mm -hmm. complex than emulsions. They can have the, the, the liquid crystalline phase, they can have vesicles, mm -hmm. they can have bilayers. And when I, probably when I was writing this, I still had that uh, concept in my head that they are emotions. Now, they probably are mm -hmm. because even if I don't have mineral oil in the formulation, I have other oily uh, mm -hmm. components like uh, octyl sterate and uh, that other one, uh, dimeticone, which is an oily, which is an oily oil. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, those are the, the two main ones. Thank you. Uh, octyl stearate and dimeticone. Okay. <clears throat> so, and on page 64, there, uh, you are discussing figure 22. Uh huh. Figure 22 in the page 64, yeah? In yes. the last paragraph, you say, from figure 32, it's possible to notice I has higher the I, and said, both higher than all the formulas. Do you see this? Okay. This can be explained by the higher oil content of the formulation. But see. It's oh, not okay. A I have, uh, have a mistake here. It's not a higher content of, you can and the uh, E, uh, and such as E, there is no patch of E, no? Yes. Um, yeah, so you have to, to see this. Yeah, again. I have to change yeah. that. Mm -hmm. What okay. happened was we had a formula E yeah. as well, and it was removed mm -hmm. because um, some of the rheological experiments mm -hmm. were uh, performed okay. wrongly for, these form for the formulation, so it was removed and it was renamed. So... I have to fix these okay. um, <coughs> these problems here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, now your work, we conclude that the cosmetic emotions were characterized as having a time-dependent behavior, okay? Mm -hmm. you agree with this? It's okay. And in your final considerations, I don't agree only one f with one of them. Then you, you changed your final consideration in your presentation, yeah? Probably. Yes, yes you, <laughs> you change a lot, but it is, it is good. But let me see the page 
85. Your final considerations. The second one, yes, the second one. Take a look at this one. I think uh, qualisense is not one of the consequences of homogenization inefficiency. How could you solve this inefficiency for next time? <laughs> How could I solve this? Well, yeah. I think that um, this is something that I kept from the dissertation and from the presentation. But in some cases, uh, I could macroscopically visualize phase separation while homogenizing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I could have done something to, uh, to assess that problem, but I chose not to because I didn't want to change the parameters of emulsification between, between batches and between samples. Okay. I think that the, there are two things that should be considered for, um, I'm sorry, uh, the, the question is to what could I do to mm -hmm. uh, prevent coalescence uh, during homo homogenization? Oh, yes, or, or your, 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 your homogenization inefficiency. Okay, um, so as I know that you are a chemical engineer, I know that you know a lot more about <laughs> this than me, but uh, I did some research on homogenization. Uh, mm -hmm homogenization equipments, okay. and the one that I used, which is the Silverson L4RT, mm -hmm. with the, 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 the cap that I was using, the square hole um, mm -hmm. high shear mixer, it does not have a, um, it does not have like a pedal to mix and increase the turbulent flow of the, of the, of the liquid inside the beaker. So what could have done is, okay, the, the first thing I, should, I could have done was to increase the velocity, increase the RPM, RPM, because what it does is it pulls liquid from the bottom and it shears over the, the square holes and it pushes them outward but not upward. Okay. So what happens is that you don't have enough turbulent flow to guarantee that the oil that is constantly migrating to the top to be mixed with the rest of the, the system. So adding a pedal to increase the turbulent flow would help, and also increasing the RPM would also help because it would increase the turbulent flow by pushing with a, a, hard, uh, a larger velocity to the, to the walls of the beaker, and then the, the, this liquid would go downward and upward and it would create this uh, mm -hmm. better homogenization system. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, perhaps Boticario can buy it, <laughs> show you a, <laughs> a better. Perhaps. For, yeah. So, uh, so uh, return here in the, the second one, I think it is destabilization occur li likely due to, okay, when mixing the formal components and not because of coalescence, but coalescence is a, uh, a manner to destabilization. So you can see this, okay. this phrase that's not so, uh -huh. so okay here. Now. So, uh, and finally, what do you think to do next to solve some issues you detected? You, you, you had a, a good results in the, uh, to preview instability, but you work a lot and you perhaps have something to to do different for the next time or for the um, There PhD. are several <laughs> things, there are several things that I wish I had done differently. The first one is uh, mainly produce better batches. <laughs> Have be having better batches would help a lot in, in um, finding the, the, the relevant variables, rheological variables. So this would help a lot. Now, there are other things in rheometry that I obviously thought about more, uh, like uh, choosing a better geometry. The cone plate geometry is perfect for measuring viscosity in, in liquids, but it's not very used for oscillatory rheometry. It can be used, it's not wrong to use, but since, uh, since you have a, a defined gap that you have to use, then you should use a plate plate geometry with a higher gap because in some cases I had droplets that were over the gap of my, my, my rheological experiments and that's 
um, it causes some questioning from, from people that really understand rheology. And then other things like um, increasing the sample size. I don't think that uh, longer periods of time, like 182 days was six months. It took over a year to perform all the experiments. But I don't think that it is necessary to evaluate the formulas to this, to, to this much time. But having a bigger um, sample size. And one thing that I didn't do because I w hoped that the batches would be very much uh, alike. I didn't perform the same experiment three times. I, didn't, I don't have any triplicates in, this, in, in my dissertation. And I think it, they should be done because um, just simply scooping out some of the cream to put on the rheometer changes the structure of the, the, the material. So if you, do the, the, if you at least do it three times or two times, you can be certain that that profile is the right profile, is the, the accurate profile of the, the sample. So there are several things, uh, methods, methods of calculating parameters, methods of several things that I could have done, but I think that these are the most important ones. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Schur. We, we want to thank you also because you, you, you did a very deep read in the document, so you found some kind of problems. Mostly, I should say, page 50, and 64, I, it is my, my fault also because I, I read the document, I read the document, so I should see such things. But it's easy to, it's easy to, correct, to, to fix course. it. So thank you very much for, for your considerations. And now I want to thank you again to Professor Murakami. So please, you have 30 minutes for your considerations. Well, thank you. Um, firstly, I would like to thank for this invitation, Professor Hilton. Uh, thank you, Dr. Khan. Thank you, Dr. Shear. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, first of all, I would like to congratulate Lucas for your presentation, for this challenge, being here, né? and, and um, talking on, in English. Yes. So it's very different. So. Uh, now you, it's, it's to be great to hear, yeah? and um, now you have you have na, a different thing. So na, you have different things. So yeah. not the peoples na, <laughs> yeah. do not accept this challenge. <laughs> yes. Okay. I, so I think not. Thank you for all. I have some marks for your work. In general, you you, you have a beautiful work. Thank so, you. Na, in this in this topic, uh, cosmetics, pharmaceutical science, no, it's it's a bit of work. So I have one question: uh, uh, Why why is work is so important for this this field? Well, something that I did not discuss uh, widely in the presentation is the reasoning of the project. Why? Actually, this project came from a demand from the industry. It wasn't something that we developed. It wasn't something that we were striving to reach. So uh, Grupo Boticario came to us to uh, one, one of their, um, their workers came to us and showed us this, this uh, experiments that she had read in, in some articles, some books. And we see that if a project like that comes to us, to the university, so we can uh, develop it and understand it, I think it, has a, a, it's, it is very relevant in the industry. Now, something that I did not present on the, the, did not show in the presentation is that if we take, on average, if every formulation needs 90 days to assess the stability, physical stability, and we have a method that reduces those 90 days to maybe two days or maybe a week. The, the, the work, the human resources that are used to assess the ability for hundreds of formulations, because that, that's what happens. In Grupo, in Grupo Boticario, they formulate hundreds of formulas each year and they all have to be tested. And 
the, the time resources that takes to assess the stability of these formulations is huge when you have a time of ni up to 90 days of stability assessment. So if we find a way to reduce that time, then that will directly uh, uh, change the costs of stability assessment. And also, uh, this too, if, if we can prove in the future that it works, uh, can be used for scaling up. So if you, you produce, uh, uh, I'm gonna scale my batch up, we can try to predict the stability of the scaled up batch and, and not waste uh, raw materials, not produce more waste in the industry. So I haven't explored these as, ma as, ma as much as the time it takes to assess stability, but I think that there are some applications also in, in raw material waste. Yeah. That's it. That's what I'm looking for in, in your text. And uh, this question is, uh, uh, is just for it, you know? And uh, in the general introduction, I was looking for, for this question, for this answer, okay. you know? When I read your work, I would like to see about uh, um, uh, how now, the industry and the factory, the commerce marketing industries, could be uh, 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 this work so be important for this thing, mm -hmm. you know. So the general introduction, I think, is missing some results. As not results, is missing some uh, literature review. Okay. Okay. And also in the abstract, I have some points. Um, I wondering about the the formulas, seven formulations. Yeah. Yeah. This is hard to me to see uh, how uh, the formulations can uh, can uh, affect you know the rheology and the other things, the physical chem parameters. Mm -hmm. So um, I think you should uh, in the, your text uh, use letters, but you you could you could uh, provide the percentage of oil. Okay. You know it, it's is more uh, suitable to, to read, no? I, can, I, I do not need to seek uh, the uh -huh. presentation. So it's uh, just little things, okay? Okay, okay. And um, in the literature review, I, I, also, I also would like to see about cosmetic industry, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, um, how né, emotions, emotions could be uh, be effect for reasons, for that reasons, you know? So, I think it's okay, it's very nice, but something is missing, okay? I just, I, 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 I had a, the, I, I just did the mark here, so you can né, okay. sit with your supervisor and make the corrections. Okay. Okay? Um, so, Another question, what kind of, um, for emotions, for the in cosmetic industry, uh, what kind of behavior the cosmetic industry looks for, for the emotions? Do you understand? Um, the kind of behavior? Yeah. Which, which in, in which aspect? Um, what kind of behavior? I, I think that um, the, best went, the best way to answer that is by... Um, explaining what I see in quality control inside the industry. And what is usually, usually done is that they, the behavior that they look for are more, um, are more, prone, to, uh, are more prone to, sorry, not, not, that's the wrong, wrong word. What they're looking for is sensory properties. Mm -hmm. It looks to me that this is more relevant for products, for cosmetic products, like odor and color, see if those changes over time, if they, they change over time, because in most cases, these products will not spend six months in a, in a shelf. They will be sold much sooner than that. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for inst more likely chemical instabilities that could change the odor and the color of the products and spreadability, and I think that this is what they're more, most interested in when uh, in the quality control 
department. Okay. And um, hello, everyone. Curious about um, you? You make your work with an emotion non-ionic. Okay, mm -hmm. Polavax. Yeah. Um, do you think it's uh, Lanet? Okay, do you know Lanet? Lanet? Yes. Do yes. you think as ionic or anionic emotions could affect the whole thing of your work? Um, I hope not. I hope to, <laughs> to make this method applicable to all types of emotions. Mm -hmm. That's the objective. I mean, we shouldn't have to um, change the, parameter, the, the parameters of the real logical analysis too much uh, to assess different formulations. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lanette, um, I, th I think that it could affect because, of course, that the wax, they're all temperature sensitive. So some may be more temperature sensitive, some may be less. Okay. So the, the behavior over temperature cycles can be different. The behavior of the rheological parameters may not be different because it depends mostly on a mechanical, on the me mechanical properties of the emotion. And well, the, well, it, they're all different, okay. but the, the wax, the polar wax, seems to be very sensitive to temperature changes. And the, in the same way, do, do you think it's the oil could affect the, the whole thing? Yes, definitely. You know, as, um, uh, vegetal, vegetal oils, you know, uh, grape oil, seed oils, yeah. almond oil, do you think, it, how, how, how the thing is going to work? Um, I didn't put a lot of thought into this because I was mo more focused on understanding rheology because yes. it was really hard at first. But definitely it can affect. I don't know how it can affect. But we know that different oils have different uh, thermal properties. Uh, we have different oils have different uh, chain lengths, alkylic chain lengths, uh, that could affect the the stability mechanisms and but I, I really don't don't put a lot of didn't put a lot of thought into this because uh, I wasn't expecting to change the formulation on on the the project okay on page 44 table one uh, you have the letters and uh, I'm just curious you know uh, why letter E is missing there's some reason for that yeah uh, <laughs> Yeah, so what happened was, uh, um, again, with the, the problem with batch reprodu okay. repro reproducibility, um, I prepared A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Okay. And I prepared three batches of formula E as well. But what happened was formula A, the original one, not the one that I presented here on the dissertation, uh, when I was preparing it, I was weighing all the, the materials, and I was using a scale that was not properly um, calibrated. And aside from that, I also performed some rheological experiments with the wrong frequency. So I chose to remove A from the dissertation, and I turned E into A because they were the same oil concentration. So removed A, turned E into A, and then I discussed results uh, based on that. And I made some mistakes because I forgot to replace uh, in some letters you know, on the dissertation. But uh, you can see that E is missing. And then G, uh, H and I have, uh, are not in order of, yeah. of oil or concentration. Because actually, when I was, when I was uh, homogenizing G, which, which is the one with 70% uh, approximately 70% of oil phase, then uh, it had separated phases before I could complete homogenization. Okay. And then I had to correct H and I, which would be 80 and 90% to have lower oil concentrations because I thought that maybe 70% is the limit that this uh, emulsifying system can uh, accept. Okay. So I had to, to reformulate them and mm -hmm. so I, because otherwise I would lose these the, the formulations. Okay, on page forty nine. Uh, just just okay. on the final on the final document I will correct those problems. I just didn't correct them now because 
on my head, F is the one that is, that, that one, H is the one, is it? But in the final document, I will mm -hmm. go from A to G. Okay, uh, no problem. <laughs> oh, that's okay. No problem. On page 49, I'm curious again, um, on the um, table two, okay, you says that um, formula, formula I, okay, it took uh, 56 days and the microscope days, you, you yeah. didn't do this analysis? What uh, happened No, no, here? It, it, uh, I should have put a legend there, ah, but okay. uh, when I put the, the hyphen there, it means that I did not see uh, physical oh, okay. uh, separation, phase separation. It is stable, this, it is stable here? No. Yeah, what? and table two. Table two, okay, but when you, you, you didn't do this analysis? No, I did no? it. You I did. mean, macro macroscopically after, 56 days, I didn't see macroscopic ah, phase okay, separation. Okay, I, I okay. I need to put a legend here okay. to make it uh, more comprehensible. Oh, the batch reproducibility is okay. No, it's not too easy to make some emotions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's hard. Well. On page 56, could you explain me what is a waxy liquid crystal? I, I'm not familiar for this this term. What is? Um, you see the first uh, topic 442. Okay, mm -hmm. you says it was possible to observe through a polarized light microscope mi microscopy that creams contain wax liquid crystal. What is what is this? Um, so in page. Uh, page 56. Yeah, page 56. So the second phrase. Yeah. So on page 26. Okay. Figure five. Um, there's a diagram of the structures found in creams, cosmetic creams. Okay. So the the waxy liquid crystal. I'm referring to. Um, the structure represented by lowercase c, lipophilic gel. And these structures, they are um, organized, um, uh, they're structures that are formed by um, aligned cetostereo alcohol molecules and that form uh, lamellar structures and they are characterized as a, a, a liquid crystal because um, the, I, I, I'm sorry, it's going to be really hard to explain that in English, oh, okay. no but uh -huh. uh, I know that you know a lot of DRX methods and yes, that's it. And uh -huh. they can be characterized by uh, DRX, no, X, XDR, X-ray diffraction. Uh -huh. And they can be characterized, one of the references by Jundinger in uh, 1984, which was the reference that I used to explain these structures, uh, he characterized these structures by X-ray diffraction and other methods. Um, and he claimed that these structures, the, the, inter the hydrophilic gel and the lipophilic gel, they are these, uh, they're formed by these crystallized wa waxy molecules, but their, their, their organization is not specifically a crystal, it's more like a mesophase, a, a, okay. a phase between liquid and, and solid. So that's the explanation of the whole thing because mm -hmm. the organization of the molecules is not uh, specific enough to characterize as a solid crystal. So it's a liquid crystal or a mesomorphic phase. Nice answer. And um, on page 68, okay, um, table six, um, the formula C is, is very, the result you obtain it is very different. Yeah. You know? um, can, you, can you tell us why, some reason, can you explain why this is different from these other uh, formulas? Well, the, Firstly, I thought that maybe the dispersity of the droplet, the, the size distribution of the droplets would be a l narrower for this formula. So the hypothesis was that if I have 
a monodispersed emulsion, then the organization of droplets would be so much locked, so locked, that the yield stress would be higher because it takes more force to destroy the structure that is very organized. But that was not the case. I, didn't, I, I thought that this would, be, this would be the case, but it wasn't. The, the size distribution was, um, was just as wide as the other ones. And I really don't know exactly why this happened. Some other explanations could be um, maybe due to dehydration or um, it has less bulk water phase, which flows easy, more easily. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know exactly why one batch of the Formula C had a really high yield stress. Okay. Yeah, because the, the percentage of mineral oil is 25%. Yes. And uh, D is 35. It's yeah. 10% plus. So, well, there's some reason. I don't know. For some reason that I, yeah. I don't know as well. Oh, finally, um, uh, the last question I'd like to, to ask you. Uh, do you think this, your work, you know, you, you can, you actually, you can change 90 days stability for two or three or four days stability? Do you think your work, um, you can um, go through Boticario and see, oh, this is my protocol, and you can uh, hire me or not fire <laughs> hire me. What, what do you think about this? Um, well, it's the in the presentation I showed you like uh, eight references about this uh, methodology. I think that is still too early to say. Okay. It is still too early to say. However, I believe that there there may be some signs that it can be used. Now, Brummer, in his book, in 2006, he published a large-scale study with hundreds of formulations, both of the pharmaceutical, um, cosmetics and food industry, where he found that formulas that had a higher variance of G prime and G double prime in higher temperatures, so higher variance in higher temperatures, destabilized a lot faster than the ones who had a, a, a no variance. On, on these values over, over temperature. Um, there seems to be more people studying this right now. There seems to be. The last reference that I found was from 2019 by Kechik, Kekic, and they compared this methodology, the, the temperature cycles test, um, to a freeze-thaw test that was performed on climatic chambers so you put uh, 24 hours on at 40 degrees Celsius and then 24 hours at 5 degrees Celsius. And they found that this test, the rheological test, was comparable, significantly comparable to thermal, uh, to freeze thaw test in climatic chambers that takes over 15 days. So there seems to be more people studying it. Um, we, of course, need a lot more studies on this subject. And with, with bigger sample sizes, with bigger uh, time of analysis, with different formulations. But uh, Isabella from Boticario was here today, and mm -hmm. they were always very interested in the project. Okay. And I think that perhaps this is something to evaluate. They have the, the capacity to evaluate hundreds of their formulations. And if they only use some of the, the workforce to do that, I think that they will come to satisfying results. Okay, nice work. Thank Once you. again, I'd like to congratulate you, congratulate Hilton. Uh, thanks a lot. It's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Professor Murakami. Uh, thank you for your considerations about the work. Um, we should say that uh, some things you ask us, we discuss it. Yes. <laughs> a little, uh, yesterday or last Friday, and we, we need to manage things to be the document much more clear. Uh, I, actually, we are looking for a grant for a new student to continue the work of Lucas. So we discussed fastly today with Boticario Group just to see if you can have some kind of grant for a new student to continue this project. And we are trying just to 
uh, increase the number of samples and to see if you are able to stabilize, to establish some kind of uh, relation between this parameter with the rheological, uh, re with the rheological stability, with the classical stability, and we want to do it uh, most maybe this this semester. Thank you very much again. So in this part of the um, defense, we want to ask to the people to leave this room because we need to we need to discuss the situation of Lucas. I just want you to stay here if you don't mind. Okay. Because now we want just to know if Lucas is approved or not. Just okay. a few minutes. Uh, shut down the YouTube transmission. <laughs> I think